All right, so it looks like it's two o'clock, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, first of all, thank you for tuning in. Uh, so my name is Elias Ellison. I'm the co-director of Human Performance at SMU. Um, so basically what we have going over today is uh, programming and exercise selection. So before I get started, uh, just a quick introduction. So I grew up in uh, New Jersey and Louisiana. Um, I actually went trained to the Marine Corps after high school, spent a few years in the Marine Corps. Um, after that, uh, my bachelor's next phase, my master kinesiology, I uh, was able to uh, join the master strength coach, Coach Cos, for a few years, bounced around to a couple of different places and got here with the new staff about uh, two, two years ago, a little over two years ago. Um, and just huge shout out to uh, the whole creative staff here at SMU, uh, C-Rod, Lauren, Tyler, Mark, all those guys upstairs. Uh, they've been putting out a lot of great content. If you guys aren't following SMU football, go ahead and do that. They're putting out new stuff every day. Um, and just, I'm blessed to be a part of a great staff here um, at SMU. I wouldn't trade it for the world. Uh, we have a very diverse staff. Uh, we all see things from different angles. So it kind of helps us a lot when we're going in and programming and doing exercise selection. And with that, not one person does the programming. So I, I'm gonna be talking about it today, but it's not just me, it's not just one person. We all do it collectively as a group. So when we present, we have our different level groups. When we present those, we present it in front of the entire staff. And uh, sometimes it can get a little ugly, um, but it's just good to do that. You never wanna just do anything like that by yourself because you can kind of get stuck in your little hole and you only see things from a certain angle. But when you template to somebody else or you program to somebody else, they can see something from a different angle or maybe something you were thinking about or even experience, experiences that they've had that they can share with you um, to kind to kind of help that. So go ahead and get started. So the first slide, um, it's not working, let me see here. Let's see. There we go. All right. Then um, before I get started is I wanna say that there's really three types of problems, right? There's a simple problem. So a simple problem is something like baking a cake. So if you're baking a cake, you kind of just follow the, the recipe guidelines, you know, preheat the oven, mix the batter, put it in for a certain amount of time and cook it. And once you get really, really good at that, you know, you can pretty much do that exact same thing every time. There's not a whole lot of external actions, right? So that is, that's, that's what's a simple problem. So a complex problem, or excuse me, a complicated problem would be like sending a, a rocket ship to the moon. So it's very complicated. It takes a lot of work, a lot of math, a lot of stuff to get it done. But once, once you're able to do it, you know, you can replicate that. It's not going to be the exact same. There's different factors, there's different variables. But once you send it once, you, can, you should be able to kind of build off of that and make it easier for next time and keep building and building and building to where it's not as complicated as a process the first time. Um, a complex problem would be like raising a child. So you can, you know, there's no real guideline to raising a child. You know, you can do certain things with one child. It's, it, it might backfire completely with the next. There's so many different factors, variables, um, just outside factors that you can't control. And I think when we're programming, a lot of people try and make it a, uh, a complex issue when it's really just, it's complicated. Um, it is complicated. It's, it's not simple. It's not cookie cutter. You can't write one program and use that for the rest of your life. Um, but it doesn't need to be um, this thing that you change every single year, right? It should be like once you kind of figure out what you're for, you can kind of keep building on it and building on it and building on it. But just wholesale changes every year, you're not going to re really be able to be great at anything. Um, you know, I think a lot of people, they read the newest thing and, oh, I just read this article and, and this is what we need to be doing right now. But if it doesn't fit with what you've been doing, it's, it's probably not the best thing to do. So just some quick questions that I asked myself or to ask yourself before you uh, write a program. So who are you creating a template for? And Coach Kaz talked about this the other day. Um, you know, what sport, what sport are you working with? What sport are you creating this template for? What are the demands of the sport? Um, you know, every sport, you know, is different. What, what energy systems does that sport utilize the most? Uh, and then you can break that even further into position, position groups. So. You know, we saw this year, you know, our O-line and our O-line, we got about 40% of the, of the sprinting volume that our, 
you know, our wide receivers got in a game. That's a completely different sport. So you can kind of curtail that to how you're going to create your program. Training age. How long have those guys been training for? You know, is it their first time in the weight room? Is it their first time in a collegiate setting? Have they ever lifted before? Are they coming, um, you know, this isn't really training, but are they coming off an injury? Just, just information like that is really going to help you kind of put you in the right uh, mindset. And then time of year, obviously. Is it in season, out of season, spring ball, fall camp? You know, what's the emphasis? So the second thing is, what is the main adaptation you're trying to obtain? Okay, so I'm going to say this. You should, you're going to hit everything. You're not only doing, you know, hypertrophy getting bigger. If, if your whole program is around hypertrophy, you know, at least in athletics, and all you do is get bigger, but you get weaker and you get slower, that's a terrible template. If all you do is get stronger, but you get smaller and you get slower, that's a terrible template. Um, if, if you get, you know, uh, faster, but if you get smaller and weaker, you know, that's not a great template. All right? you need, you're going to be addressing all those things, but the main emphasis should be the main emphasis and everything else will kind of go with it as long as you're choosing the right exercises and movements and working in the right percentages. So hypertrophy, or you want to get them bigger. Uh, is it a younger guy? You want to put some size on them? You want to get some strength, strength, speed, speed, strength, kind of what is the main focus of that group or of that program? Third thing, what can such are you able to coach? So again, this is kind of hit on the other day, but what equipment do you have available? Okay. Um, if you don't have blocks and you want to do clean from the blocks, well, you're not gonna be able to do that. You want to do safety bar squats and you don't have a safety bar. Guess what? You're probably not gonna be able to do that. So just because you see something that other people are doing, you might not be able to replicate that because you don't have the equipment. So it's especially new when you're going to a new school or a new facility. What equipment do you have? What is available to you? You know, not everybody has the same stuff. Uh, available coaches. This is a problem that I ran into this past block. So if you're doing things, how does that spread you out on the floor? Luckily, we have, you know, um, a big piece of turf in the back of the weight room. I did a lot of loaded carries this year. Um, but that was sort of a superset with a couple other exercises. So Luckily, I was able to have another coach to kind of go over there and kind of help coach that up and make sure they got, you know, their 20 yards or 10 yards, however far it was, and make sure they got all the reps. But if I didn't have that, I wouldn't have been able to do that. And that was something I didn't think about at first. It's just, do you have the available coaches to, if you're going to do all these complex exercises, do you have enough available coaches to coach everything and make sure it's done properly? Um, and experience with the exercise. Obviously, you know, if you haven't done it, doesn't have to be done well but if you haven't done it yourself I do not suggest you going in there and, and, and programming for athletes right if you see on Instagram somebody does a kneeling jump to a boxu ball jump on a box with a barbell on the if that's what you want to do fine but go ahead and do it yourself first that way you know break your neck or something and then you, you can't make anybody else do it I don't know I've done, again, you don't have to do it with the same amount of weight, but just trying it out yourself first. If you're trying bands out for the first time on athletes, that's, that's, not, that's not right. All right? They, they shouldn't be the lab rats. You should be the lab rat. Um, so, you know, do it yourself first. Uh, the last thing is what is the athlete doing outside the weight room? On field work, obviously, um, but that includes what, what you have prescribed on the field as well. So if you're doing kind of more of a, an a, and okay, more sprints, more plyometrics. Maybe you want to, you know, they're already primed for some some cleans and some squats. If you go outside and do a bunch of stuff and you just crush them outside, you crush them in running, do you really want to squat that day? Is, is that the day you want to have your squat? So when we're looking at this, we kind of put all of our running stuff up, you know, all whatever, six weeks, eight weeks kind of up. We have a pretty good idea of what we're going to be doing at that time. Okay, I know we have sled sprints this day. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do, you know, my heavy squats, or I don't want to do my sprints because they're going to bust a hamstring. Um, so kind of just putting that in place first. And we, and, you know, for myself, it's just going off of the weight room, what we did outside. So complementing what we did outside, inside the weight room. Um, practice, obviously, you know, if you don't have GPS, 
you can just kind of keep an eye on and watch. Obviously, your skill guys are going to get more running than your bigs. So do you think you can get away with lifting your bigs a little bit more because they're not doing as much at practice? I don't know. Uh, finals. So with finals or, or big testing weeks, especially at like a, a school like SMU or, or some of the more private schools, um, the guys are stressed out. So most of the injuries you're going to see in the weight room occur during a finals week or during a midterm because the guys are stressed. They're not eating. They're not sleeping. Um, they've got a lot of stuff on their minds and, you know, lifting might not be the priority at that point. So you kind of got to be cognizant of that. And you, you definitely don't want to, you know, max out during final week. It's probably not a good idea. Um, so just being cognizant of what they have going on in their plate. So exercise selection. Um, you're going to want to emphasize whole body strength movements that are performed powerfully. So just like Coach Kale was talking about yesterday, you know, perform powerfully, perform with intent. You want to make sure that you're not just going through the motions. You're performing those exercises powerfully. Um, if you're doing squat, every rep, you should still be driving at the bottom as fast as you can. You're not going to see a whole lot of, you know, three by 20 or anything like that with us because you, you can't perform that powerfully. But going back to the 80-20 rule, 80% um, of your benefits are going to come from 20% of your exercises. So what does that mean? Olympic variation, squat, press, pull, post chain. If all you do, you know, in three days, Monday you come in, clean pull, back squat, uh, bend over row. Day two, cleans, bench press, RDLs. Day three, clean pull, front squat, and pull-ups. That's, that's the meat and potatoes right there. So that, that's where you're going to get the most bang for your buck. That's where the focus should be on. It should not be on the 20%. Um, if you just keep it simple and just focus cleans, your squats, not even your press, you know, your post chain and your pull. Like that's, that's your money makers there. Everything else, the accessories, that stuff will take care of itself. But that's where you're going to get the most bang for your buck. That's where the focus should be on. Um, if you, if you mess up, mess up on the excess, what did, what did you really accomplish? Um, and just starting, starting at something that's going to help with some of these movement variations is just the complex. I know coach has been, has been you know, preaching on it, telling everybody you need to incorporate the complex. If you're not, you need to do it. Um, it's great for even just a warm up. If all you do is come in, jumping jacks, seal jacks hit a stretch, and then you get a couple sets of the complex. This, this thing is money. So if you see at the top there, there's a few different loading schemes. So a novice, you want to begin with a dowel rod, you know, PVC stick, something for beginners, and progress to about 30% body weight. So what is that? For a 180-pound guy, that's like 60 pounds. So 65 pounds, you put a 10 on each side. That's what they should build up to for a novice. High school, um, even, you know, freshman collegiate freshmen build up to that. All you're doing is for us, it changes, but RDL, high pull, muscle clean, front squat to press, bent over row, five each, you can go three each, whatever you want to do, and you kind of keep building to that. So if you get want to get more advanced, if you progress to 50% for a smaller athlete, 50% of body weight, what does that look like? I mean, shoot, even if a guy's 225, and you build up, you have to build up to it. Never just go straight into it. And it's still going to be heavy. If you go, the guy weighs 225 and he ends up going up to, you know, 115. That, that, that's something, it doesn't sound like a lot, but it, it adds up over time. A larger athlete, someone, I'd say 275 and up. So a 300 pound guy, if they build up to 40% of their body weight, that's, 120 pounds if you're 300 pounds so that's about 50 percent of a 225 guy um but but that thing is no joke you know why again if you do two sets of five reps of each exercise at 65 pounds right that's a total of 3,250 pounds moved and that's every single day so that means if you do two sets of five reps every day you're getting at least 10 rdl you know with lightweight 
10 high pull, 10, you know, muscle cleans, 10 front squats or presses, and 10 bent over rows every day, every single day. Every day you come to the weight room, you're getting 10 of those. That adds up. If you want to learn how to do a movement, do it repeatedly. It doesn't, it's not supposed to be heavy, but you will get more out of that than anything else. So it improves movement patterns, number one. It increases the work capacity, especially if you get up to those, some of those higher heavy end weights. And obviously, you know, grip strength, that's added uh, bonus, especially when you get to some of those higher weights. You know, that's the best way to do it. Exercise variation. So how often should exercises be changed? Um, it, I guess it depends on who you ask. I would not suggest, I would, you know, at least three to four weeks before you even start thinking about changing it. You know, if you're doing, you know, West Side Conjugate, that's something completely different. You know, obviously, um, that's, that's different for us or for myself, perform and exercise for at least three to four weeks. You know, it, it's going to take a week or two if it's something they've never done for them just to figure it out. So if you're changing it every week or every two weeks, you're really not building on anything. Um, and again, focus on changing the emphasis, not so much the exercises. So I'm not going to go from a, a clean to a snatch one week and then, well, no, now we're going to do a split jerk. No. You know, if you're going to, if you're a hand clean and you want to change it, maybe you go clean from the floor. It's still the same exercise. The emphasis has changed a little bit more from the pull from the floor, you know, barbell military to dumbbell military. Um, or even just going from an eccentric to isometric. That's a completely an eccentric squat to isocentric, uh, isometric squat, completely different. All right, so don't feel like anything's got to be changed every other week. You know, keep it simple. It might seem boring, but you're going to get the most bang for your buck just repeating and being great at those few exercises that you want to do. You know, the 20% exercises is you're going to get 80% of the benefit. That's where you're going to make your money at. All right, so here's where we talk about sport specific training. I keep saying my internet connection is unstable. All right, uh, sport specific training. So I guess it depends on what you call sport specific training. Um, there's different definitions. Here's what I'm going to say our main focus is reducing injuries and enhancing force production. Those two things enhance your, 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 your sport specific training. If, that, if you do those two things, you will improve in your sport. Those are sport specific you know, qualities, reducing injuries and enhancing force production, right? If you increase the strength and power of the legs and hips of a basketball player, you increase his vertical. Is that sport specific training? Sure, why not? You know, you increase his vertical, that's gonna help him. If you increase the strength and power and legs of hips of a baseball player, that's gonna increase, you know, him swinging a baseball bat. If you do that for a football player, it's gonna increase his top end speed or his initial burst off the line. It's, these are sport specific training, if that makes sense. It's not, you don't need to kick, you know, a weighted soccer ball if you're a soccer athlete. It's not sport specific training, right? Skills are sport specific. Shooting a basketball is a skill. That's not my job. My job is not to teach this guy. I can, I can reduce injuries and I can help increase his vertical. I can make sure, you know, he stays in the game a little bit longer. You know, we can uh, educate him on nutrition and how his body works and help him make great choices. But I am not going to teach him how to shoot a basketball. I can't shoot a three to save my life. All right. Eurostep, I got you. But the three is not, it's, it's not what I do. I, I'm not a skill. I'm not going to teach you how to, sh how to hit a, uh, a baseball. That's not my job. That's not what I'm great at. That's not what I do. I'm, I'm not gonna be able to help you with skills. Skills are sports specific, right? The, and just like Coach Colley talked about, the body only has one nervous system. It doesn't have a separate nervous system for football or basketball or track. If you train the nervous system, it's going to help you in all, in all athletics, it's going to increase overall athleticism. And that's, that's the main focus. That's the main goal, not increasing your skills, but increasing overall athleticism, reducing injuries, enhancing force production. That's the focus. All right. So 
Still talking about that a little bit with accessory work at 20%, uh, or I guess 80%. But the focus of accessory work should be help improve performance in fundamental lifts, right? So you're helping improve your cleans, uh, your squats, your rows. So accessory work, that includes the complex. You put that in the beginning, that's gonna help improve performance in fundamental lifts by helping them learn the movement patterns. Uh, number two, injury prevention. I include hypertrophy and injury prevention. So if you're trying to put on size, um, that's going to help you to absorb force and reduce injuries. Um, I'm going to use this example. I don't know if it works. Kill me in the comments if it doesn't. So I have this phone, right? It's a phone. I don't know what number it is. I couldn't afford the third camera. All right, it's a normal phone. Let's just say this is athlete. It's athlete, it's fast, it works good, all right? Injury prevention, hypertrophy, it's still fast, it's still the same. If I drop it, it's going to crack. If I drop this phone, it's going to crack. There's nothing protecting it. It's bare bones, you know, it's gonna crack. If I try and text something, my fingers are gonna be bleeding. It's, it's, gonna, it's gonna be a whole ordeal. I don't wanna do that. Okay, so what can I do? Okay, let's say I put, you know, one of just little screen protectors. Okay, I put a screen protector, you know, it looks cool. You know, I can still, you know, it's slick, it'll still fit in my, in my, in my pocket. That's basically just doing some curls and stuff. Yeah, it looks cool. If I drop it, it's probably protected a little bit, but not really, you know, if I drop it on the back, this is still gonna shatter. If I'm building, you know, real hypertrophy, if I'm putting some, some mass on my back, if I'm putting, you know, muscle on, it's not so much body, it's not bodybuilding muscle. It doesn't look cool. It's bulky like this screen protector or this phone protector. If I drop it, it's going to bounce around. It's going to be fine. It can absorb force. And, and that's the goal. It's not to look cool. It's to absorb force. All right. That's what's going to prevent injuries more than anything. It's just having some meat on your bones and being able to absorb some of that force. Um, the third thing, this is where you address a particular requirement of sport or skill. Okay, you want to talk about sports? Well, someone might say, okay, well, what about the concussion rate, you know, in football? Okay, this is where, you know, in accessory work, if you want to do, you know, your neck training, this is where you do it. I'm not saying that sports don't have a specific requirement, right? The problem isn't with addressing the demands or requirement of a, a sport skill. The problem is with emphasizing it. If you're worried about concussions and all you do is neck training, you're missing the point, right? You're gonna be able to prevent more concussions, putting on masks through squats, some heavy pulls and all that than you are before you get neck work. I hope that makes sense. Um, if you're gonna address, you know, particular, if you're, you know, women's soccer, ACLs, if you wanna, you know, address ACL, do it in the accessory work. There are specific things that need to be addressed in a sport, but the emphasis cannot just be on those small minute details the emphasis needs to be on increasing force production, reducing injuries and athleticism as a whole. So don't focus on the little, the little problems, focus on the bigger issues at hand. Man, um, any questions? I kept it short. All right, um, if you guys watched Coach Calais yesterday, I'm sure your brains are bleeding a little bit. He went into some pretty deep scientific stuff I didn't want to go everything, anything too crazy. You know, if they don't kick me off after this one time, we'll go in a little bit more depth, maybe, you know, next week or the week after into uh, volume, you know, how we choose volume, how we go into our intensities, different rep schemes, stuff like that. I want to keep it real basic. Um, if you have any questions, please, three days ago, send me a little bit just because any questions, feel free to reach out. Uh, I really appreciate you guys tuning into this. Um, if there's anything that I thought that, just go ahead, email me here me
mean, I sucked. Question.